Somewhere on the Straits of Florida, 1994. Two days from home. Rain lashed Isabel as she shoveled water out of the boat. Scoop, pitch. Scoop, pitch. The bottom of the boat filled as fast as they could bail it out. Isabel, her mother, her father, her grandfather, Luis, Ivan, Senora Castillo, they all worked feverishly, none of them talking. Not that they could hear each other over the storm. The only ones not bailing were Senor Castillo, who looked like a ghost, and Amara, who clung to the rudder with white-knuckled hands and tried to keep the boat turned into the churning waves so it wouldn't capsize. The engine hadn't worked since their escape from the tanker. The storm clouds turned the day into night, and the driving rain soaked Isabel to the bone. She shivered in the cold wind, her feet numb in the water sloshing at the bottom of the boat. Sea spray stung her eyes, and in between scoops of water, she dragged her arm across her face, trying to wipe away the salt water tears. As she watched the surging waves, Isabel remembered the last time she had seen her abuelita, her grandma. She remembered Lita's hand reaching out for help as the tide swept her away. Isabel had been nine years old. Her parents had sent her to stay with Lito and Nita in their little shack on the coast. They hadn't said why, but Isabel was old enough to know her parents had been fighting again, and they wanted to be alone while they worked things out. All that spring, Isabel had waded without joy in the ocean, waiting for the storm to come that would tear her family apart. And then the real storm had come. It wasn't a hurricane. It was bigger than a hurricane. A gigantic cyclone that stretched from Canada down through the United States and across Cuba and into Central America. Later, they would call it the storm of the century, but to Isabel, it was the storm. The shrieking wind ripped roofs off houses and pulled palm trees straight out of the ground. The rain fell sideways. Hail shattered windows like a never-ending shotgun blast. And the ocean... The ocean rose up like a giant hand and reached inland, over Lito and Lita's little house by the sea, smothering the house in its giant paw and dragging the shattered pieces back into its lair. Lito and Lita hadn't known the storm was coming, or they wouldn't have been there. They would have been inland, found higher ground. Castro had promised he would protect them, but he didn't. Not then. Not Isabel's grandmother. Lito had been able to hold on to Isabel, but Lita had been swept away. She had slipped under the waves, her arms still reaching for Lito, for Isabel. And that was the last they had ever seen of her. Lito's arm found Isabel again now, and wrapped her in a hug. I know what you're thinking, he said close to her ear where she could hear him. I'm thinking about it, too. I miss her, Isabel told her grandfather. I miss her, too, Lito said. Every day. Real tears came into Isabel's eyes now, and Lito hugged her tighter. That was her song's end, Lito whispered. But ours plays on. Come, keep bailing, or soon it'll be up to our eyeballs. Isabel nodded and went back to scooping water. What if her life was a song? No, not a song. A life was a symphony with different movements and complicated musical forms. A song was something shorter, a smaller piece of a life. This journey was a song, Isabel realized, a son cubano, and each part of it was a verse. The first verse had been the riot, a blast of trumpets, the rat-a-tat-tat -tat of a snare drum, then the pre-chorus of trading her trumpet for gasoline, the piano that gave the song its rhythm, and then the chorus itself, leaving home. They were still leaving home, still hadn't gotten to where they were going. They would return to the chorus again and again before they were done. 
But what was the refrain? And how many more verses would there be before they got to the climax of the song? That brash moment at the end of a son cubano that echoed the refrain. And then the coda. Those brief few notes that tied it all together. She couldn't think about that now. All she could do now was scoop water. Scoop water and pray they didn't drown in the mad conga solo that drummed against the side of their tiny metal boat.